Welcome back, everyone, to our uh, latest talk with Winfried Heisinger, uh, which is developing practical quantum computers with millions of qubits. In order to be able to build large scale devices, a quantum computer needs to be modular. We have um, uh, people, uh, some people have invented an alternative method uh, where modules are connected via electric fields, allowing ions to be transported from one module to another, giving rise to much faster connection speeds which uh, substantially simplify the required engineering. Incorporating these two inventions, um, uh, Winfrey's team has unveiled the first industrial bl blueprint on how to build large-scale quantum computers, which uh, he will discuss in this talk. He'll show the progress in construction of a quantum computer prototype featuring his technology using modern silicon uh, microchip technology. So Winfrey, thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for in inviting me uh, to this meeting. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our efforts and our work of building practical quantum computers with millions of qubits. And, and uh, so I'm going to give this talk in my function as, as chief scientist and chairman of uh, uh, quantum computing company Universal Quantum. Uh, <clears throat> I also have a second hat, and that is uh, being a professor of quantum technologies in, uh, at the University of Sussex. And so I'm going to maybe show a few results uh, from the work uh, there as well. Okay, so let's get started with thinking about how you should build a quantum computer. And in order to best think about that, is it makes sense to think about the two computational regimes for quantum computers. And, and one is uh, referred to as noisy intermediate scale quantum devices, or NISC. And that is a computational regime uh, where you don't correct for errors, which you cannot avoid. And because you don't correct for errors, it means the number of uh, applications is rather limited. But there's a lot of work right now going on around the world in, in thinking of applications for this kind of application regime and the reason why that is so attractive is because quantum computers um, can work which hold only a, a, a handful of qubits maybe 50 maybe 100 qubits uh, maximum and that will be sufficient to do computations in that regime now you've probably heard a lot about the fantastic applications of quantum computing and most of these unfortunately are in a regime which we refer to as fault tolerant quantum computing. And what that means is it requires error corrections, and that also requires that all operations within the quantum computer must happen with an error below a certain threshold, which we call the fault tolerance threshold. And so most of the applications you now, uh, which are really interesting, um, require fault tolerant operation. And that in practice means we need around millions or even billions of qubits to make such a machine work. And so who are we? Who is Universal Quantum? And we are a quantum compu computing hardware company uh, with the goal of building quantum computers that are capable of holding millions of qubits. And, and the type of qubit we're using are charged atoms or ions. So how are we going about making such a machine a reality? I know that is uh, what we are saying it seems quite ambitious, considering that the quantum computers nowadays have maybe 50 or 70 qubits. And so what we are trying to do is, is, is really quite different to what, uh, what technology is currently uh, available uh, to achieve. So um, the reason why we are working with trapped ions uh, is multiple. So trapped ions are technology that's actually a room temperature technology. And, and we actually not quite using it at room temperature, but very mild coolings around 70 Kelvin. And, and, and so the kind of uh, very famous hardware platform, which a lot of people uh, think of or when, when they think of quantum computers, superconducting qubits, that requires a dilution or refrigerator having to cool all the way to milli Kelvin temperatures to minus, two, minus 273 degrees Celsius. And so because you need a lot of cooling uh, 
you don't have much cooling power available at that very low temperature. That makes it much more challenging to scale to really large qubit numbers. And this is where trapped ions have really a significant advantage. And maybe another advantage, which I should point out to, is the availability of modular architectures. And so in, 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 uh, when you want to build a quantum computer with so many qubits, you need some kind of modular structure. And indeed, trapped ions have two different modular structure, tested modular structures already available. And maybe the final reason why, why we're using uh, trapped ions is the reason that our qubits are atoms. And atoms, by the very definition, are identical, and so that that makes a use uh, a big difference in enabling us to scale to large qubit numbers. So, what what is an ion trap? So, traditionally, uh, an ion trap actually consisted out of a, a number of metal rods, just like you see here on the top of a screen, and and obviously something like that wouldn't really loan itself to build a scalable quantum computer. And so many, many years ago, people started to build microchips. And in fact, when I was a postdoc many, many years ago, um, I was <clears throat> we built one of the very first ion microchips. And these devices have now over the years really, really advanced. And and, and that allows us now to uh, make use of silicon microfabrication to develop these microchips. And then the ion is levitating above the, sur the, the, the surface of this microchip uh, making use of electric fields that hold each individual ion above the, the chip. Now, um, the chip then sits inside a vacuum system, and this is a picture of one of these vacuum systems. The, 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 the vacuum system is maybe kind of this size. It, it's, 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 it's really small, and right in the center, um, the, in, inside the vacuum system, there's a microchip. And above the surface of the microchip is that we are holding individual ions. And, and you can see here, there's, there's a bunch of feed throughs and, and connections, and, and but, but it's, it's a very, very simple uh, system. And that really helps when you want to build uh, such complicated things as, 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 a, as a quantum computer. So uh, what we're saying seems, 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 seems quite uh, ambitious. And so why do we think we can scale our architecture to millions of, of, of qubits? And, and, and so the answer really lies in, in six distinct technology uh, pillars. And I'm going <clears> to <throat> discuss them in, in a little bit of detail. So one of them I've already uh, discussed, which is the, the cooling technology. So we don't really require much cooling. Um, we use trapped ions as our qubit, and, and that has inherently a, a lot of advantages. So, <clears throat> so trapped ions have also some disadvantages, and one of these known are is the use of pairs of laser beams to make quantum gates, and we've replaced this by a new uh, technique where we can actually execute uh, quantum gates by the application of a voltage field chip. And in fact, we are producing fully um, microfabricated silicon microchip quantum computer modules. And, and in order to make this modular, we, we use electric field links. And all of that then comes together in, in, in a, a practical engineering focus. And I'm going to show you a little bit about what I mean by that, really. So let, let's get started to discuss this in more detail. So, so many quantum computer platforms are, are using making use of dilution refrigeration, so of this extremely low um, temperature. And that means there's very limited amount of cooling power available at such a temperature. And, and this is where we have a huge advantage because our approach actually that doesn't require any cooling or if, if that's very mild cooling. And, and the mild cooling actually we have primarily to cool the classical electronics is actually not much to do with the uh, quantum computer itself. And so that's in fact a picture you see of one of our quantum computer prototypes in, in, in our lab in, in the research group at, at Sussex. So the qubits we use are, are trapped ion qubits. And, um, and so these are ions are charged atoms. And each atom levitates on the surface of a silicon microchip. And because all of these qubits are um, identical and extremely well isolated from the environment, um, this makes uh, a trapped ion quantum computer really easily controllable and an extremely mature um, uh, quantum computing technology. And so what, what do I mean by mature? <clears throat> I, I, what I mean by that is that trapped ions hold world record in nearly all important specifications, such as 
errors for the implementation of single or two qubit gates, <coughs> the, uh, the coherence um, uh, times, or even the, the connectivity, which is also a really important um, a factor when you build practical quantum computers. Right, so that's our first. Uh, so, um, and th the way how this then looks like is, is, is on this picture, you have this array of electrodes on a microchip. So each of these uh, squares that correspond to an electrode on the microchip. And so this then gives rise to, to a, a network of, of, of roads and junctions. And by applying particular voltages to each of these electrodes, you can now move ions across this architecture. Just you could think of that a little bit like a game of Pac-Man, really. And a quantum algorithm now, the execution of a quantum algorithm, really corresponds to a sequence of quantum gate operations and ion transport operations, where you move the ions across the surface by simply by changing voltages to the electrodes in the surface. And um, in each of these X junctions, you can see um, now we have uh, uh, sections where you uh, execute a quantum gate and sections where you can read out the quantum state of the ion, but also sections where you can reload an ion, because imagine if you're going to go to uh, millions of ions, then eventually <clears throat> some ions will just um, uh, have collisions and will disappear, and so you can then easily reload them using such loading zones. Um, so trapped ion quantum computer traditionally was implemented by aligning pairs of laser beams with an accuracy of around 10 micrometers under the position of a pair of ions. And with that, people have made tremendous breakthroughs, in fact, broke all the world records in, in terms of errors for, for quantum gates. And that works really well with a handful, maybe 10, 100, or even a 1,000 ions you can imagine doing the type of engineering to align all these laser beams. But what are you going to do when you have millions or even billions of laser beams? Could you align all of these pairs of, of laser beams with, with such accuracy and then control each laser beam's power, position, and phase um, to the required accuracy to make uh, these quantum gates work within the execution of a quantum algorithm? So what, what, what we have invented at the University of Sussex and now develop as part of universal quantum is a new technique where instead of using laser beams, we simply apply voltages to a microchip in order to uh, execute uh, uh, quantum gates. And that makes actually use of, of uh, microwave technology, the very same technology that you've got in your mobile phone. So this is the kind of explanation of, of how this works. So that's probably the most complicated slide in my presentation. So, so, so um, I'm going to try to walk you through this. But if, if it's a little bit too difficult, I can also refer you to a paper where you can read this up in more detail and, and ask me about that during, during the questions, please. So you can see here um, uh, uh, this picture at the top. And you can see this array of X junctions. And you can see ions levitating above the surface of this chip. And now you can move these ions simply by uh, changing the voltages on the electrodes in the surface here to move them around. Now, what I'm going to plot here is this dashed line is the is uh, three quantum gate zones. So each X junction has one quantum gate zone. And now I'm going to plot the magnetic field along this line of these X junctions here. And um, and now what you see here is that there are these very, there's this very steep magnetic field gradient located in, in each one of these quantum gate zones. And these gradients we make use in order to change the energy separation of the qubit. Now, one thing you have to know is that this qubit splitting uh, is a function or depends on the applied magnetic field. So if I have a large magnetic field, the qubit splitting is large. If I have a small magnetic field, the qubit splitting is small. And you can see now by moving the ion along um, by, uh, I can now put the ion in a different, a different magnetic field position, a different magnetic field amplitude. So looking, for example, at the, uh, uh, the blue, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the small inset on the left, I'm going to 
apply a certain voltage now, so which would place the ion into position Z1, and that would make the ion then feel a uh, magnetic field B1. And that gives rise to a certain energy splitting of this qubit. When we now shine in microwaves from everywhere inside, inside this quantum, uh, inside this device, then this ion cannot absorb these microwaves because the energy separation of the qubit is not equal to the frequency of the microwaves. And so what you see here, nothing happens, no gate is implemented because simply the ion cannot absorb these microwaves. Now let's have a look in the, in the middle picture here. So there I'm gonna apply now a different voltage V2 that's gonna place my ion in a different position Z2. And now suddenly the ion feels a different magnetic field B2. Now that's gonna change the energy separation of my qubit. And that in turn means that suddenly the qubit can absorb these global microwave fields and that will then give rise to a single qubit gate. And equally, um, if I, in a different zone, where to apply a different voltage, V3, so you can see that on the right little inset here, that would now place two ions in a different position, Z3. And now these two ions again experience a different magnetic field, which gives rise to a different energy splitting of my qubit. And that could be then equal to global fields that give rise to a two qubit gate. So what you see what we're doing here is by uh, by using this technique and by using these localized magnetic field gradients, we can now simply execute a quantum gate uh, using global microwave fields uh, by the application of a voltage to a microchip. Now, what is so different or amazing about this scheme? The, the, the great thing about the scheme is that the number of uh, radiation fields does not scale anymore with the number of qubits. So that means if you have if you have a quantum computer with 100 qubits or if you have a quantum computer with a million qubits that um, um, mean that requires the same number of microwave fields and so this is really uh, very really powerful if you want to scale a quantum computer to millions or even billions of qubits and and all of this makes use of very well developed microwave technology very similar technology as what, what you've got in your mobile phone so all of this comes together now in, in, in the realization of silicon microchip modules. And um, uh, you can see the uh, micro, as one of these modules here. So you can see uh, on the top layer, on the surface, you see these arrays of, um, of, um, of ion traps, X junctions. And below the surface, you have an, a lot of the classical electronics that generates the voltages, so digital to analog converters and FPGAs or ASICs electronics in order to generate the voltages. Uh, and so this then gives rise to a fully electronic quantum computing module fabricated simply from silicon. And uh, obviously that capitalizes really on the wealth of expertise uh, developed in, in microchip fabrication. That really helps if you can make use of make use of this. Right. <clears throat> so so this um shows you in a way uh, how we can build machines with maybe thousands of qubits but eventually the module can only be as large as maybe a commercial wafer and so how do you make the machine truly modular so in order to build a quantum computer that can truly work with millions or uh, billions of qubits it needs to have some kind of modular architecture and one of the solutions available you can see here on the right hand side so this is a a a, a machine. So you can hear, you can see the the um, quantum computing modules at the bottom, and and each quantum computing module will hold a certain number of qubits. And now uh, this technique makes use of what we call photonic interconnects, optical fibers that connect one quantum computing module and another quantum computing module to a set of detectors. I won't go into too much detail how this technique works. But the connection speed after around 15 years of development um, is now at 180 per second at a fidelity of 94%, which then really boils down to a real connection speed of, of a few tens per second. And so that's very slow to connect quantum computing modules. And, and also the engineering to, to achieve this is extremely challenging. So 
in my group at the, at, at the University of Sussex, we developed a different approach altogether that makes use of electric field links between adjacent quantum computing modules. And you can see this here. You simply shape the electrodes on the edge of each quantum computing module in such a way that the electric field lines can link up. And if, they can, if the electric field lines can link up, we can now simply transport by applying a voltage to these chips, we can now transport an ion from one module to another module. Now, the advantage of that is that you can achieve connection speeds orders of magnitude fa faster, while at the same time uh, have very much simplified engineering in order to achieve that. And that's obviously really important when you want to build practical devices to have a really, really simple engineering design to achieve that. And, and so this is maybe um, one of the key ingredients of the scalable architecture. And so this is in a, in a way the, the, um, the, the way how this works. But now I can show you a, a picture from our lab at Sussex. Uh, the, you can see now the, um, uh, a microchip design here on the left that has current carrying wires integrated. And remember, we, we make use of these magnetic field gradients inside our design, and these are generated by a current in these current carrying wires. But then uh, you need a microchip with a perfect edge. And this is what, you're gonna, what you see here in the middle picture. We've recently managed to produce such a microchip uh, that, it, that allows us now to establish these electric field links between adjacent quantum computing modules. So that has been a really fantastic breakthrough, and we have now a really fantastic chip to achieve that. And so now I'm going to show you the first prototype um, of such a machine. So, so it's in our, in our, uh, in our <clears throat> research group at Sussex. So you can see these two squares and at the top, these are two um, uh, individual um, chips which are um, uh, placed in vicinity to each other with around distance of around 10 micrometers, and it allows us to demonstrate this ion transport, this really fast uh, link between adjacent quantum computing modules. Now, <clears throat> I've shown you five distinct um, um, corner uh, stones or, or, or to in, in terms of technology. Uh, that should, en should enable us to build practical quantum computers. But all of that really then comes together in, in what we think of as a really strong engineering focus. And, and that kind of has really started in 2017 when we published the very first practical blueprint to build a quantum computer with millions of qubits. Uh, and this incorporated um, our really hard work to include a lot of the required engineering considerations into this blueprint, such as cooling, required cooling, the, the type of electronics required, the size, and, and, and all of these things we, we try to write into this blueprint in order to, to understand how this could be really uh, made a reality. And, and, and so to give you a feeling of how, how big a machine would be like, uh, if you wanted to build a quantum computer with millions of qubits, that would maybe be a four meter times four meter size machine. If you wanted billions of qubits, which obviously uh, we, we, that, is, that is still very, very far, you're probably looking at maybe eight or 10 meters, but, but uh, I think, I think um, millions of qubits would already be a very, very impressive milestone and that wouldn't be such a uh, substantially large machine. So, so we are now, as part of universal quantum, really in the process of, of, of addressing these engineering challenges in order to build practical machines. And so first of all, we are now developing these microchips, as I've explained them before, um, with these X-junction geometries, um, where we, uh, which are then, in a way, the unit uh, vector, in a way, of this larger architecture. Below the surface, we incorporate now the full all the electronics. Below the surface, we incorporate things like detectors, and and so uh, you can see a little picture here from again from 
uh, work from our research group in Sussex, where we've known the process of making microchips with with uh, holes where we can below the surface mount detectors, which allow us to detect the quantum state of an ion. And so all of this comes together now in this in this little film, which shows you the architecture. So so you can see here now a loading zone. And in the loading zone, we load the ions into the ion trap. We now transport them to a quantum gate zone, making use of current carrying wires below the surface. We, we can entangle two ions and, um, and using global microwave fields that are irradiated everywhere across the architecture of this quantum computer. We can transport the ions now across the architecture. Here, for example, in the detection zone, where we've got a we've got a detector integrated below the surface of the chip. We still make use of laser beams, but these laser beams are now global laser beams that go across the architecture and can interact with thousands of atoms to do the detection. And you can see here now the execution of a quantum algorithm. So so ions are just transported across the architecture all in parallel. And, and as I said, like it looks a bit like a game of Pac-Man. So this is, shows you a quantum computing module that would be the size of a commercial wafer, and it could hold maybe a few thousand X junctions. And in order to uh, then scale this up, you can mount such a module on a, on, a, on a frame and making use of things like piezoelectric actuators, you can now simply align one module with respect to another module. And you can see here, if these modules are misaligned, the electric field links don't work and the ions can transport. But as soon as you align the, these modules, only with an accuracy of around maybe 10 microns, you can now transport ions from one quantum computing module to another quantum computing module. And so um, this now allows you to scale this to much larger qubit numbers. And, um, and I don't need to show you the rest of the number, but this really scales to really millions of qubits, even billions of qubits, just by simply uh, uh, adding more and more of these quantum computing modules.